tokenize this. I am loving what I'm hearing from Kyle about Blockchain Explained. Definitely go pick up yourself a, a copy. But now I have the great pleasure of having in person Carlos Domingo, the CEO of Founder Securitize. He flew all the way to Miami. I'm just kidding. He, he did fly in here, but he was traveling. He lives I got here. lost on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> he got lost on the way here. Um, but he's here. We're live and in person, and we're going to dive into the story of Securitize, which is easily one of the leading, most pioneering companies in this industry. We're going to hear it from the horse's mouth. But before we get into the good stuff, Carlos, why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about your background, even before you got into digital assets and, and tokenization? Good. Well, thanks for having me first, and uh, congratulations for the fifth anniversary. It's been a, a long journey together. Yeah, you guys are coming up space. on six. So. <laughs> we'll talk about this uh, later. So my background is I'm originally from Barcelona, from Spain. I studied computer science, so I'm a, I'm a technical person at heart, even though I don't code anymore, unfortunately. But I think I'm technical enough to understand the engineers and being able to discuss with them. I studied computer science in Barcelona. Then I did uh, a, a master and a PhD. In Japan, of all places, uh, I got a scholarship to go there. I studied in a place called the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And when I finished my, my PhD and my postdoc, then is when I started my career. Initially, in something interesting, interestingly, it was called digital assets, but had nothing to do with this industry. It was referring to the, the assets that were digitized on the internet at that time, which were images, fonts, and things like that. This is the the beginning of the of the internet uh, 20 years ago. So, so we basically going to the space with this giant startup, was one of the first employees. Um, started as their CTO, and then um, the, the startup in Japan expanded in the U.S. through acquisitions, and I, I moved there, worked in the West Coast for a period of time, and, you know, we went from, like, doing an IPO to completely crash and got delisted, so I, I've, I've been through bear markets <laughs> before in a different context, and it's pretty painful, but, you know, if you survive, then you emerge, uh, you know, as a stronger uh, company, and that's what happened there, and then after that, I completely shifted uh, gears, and I was recruited by a company called Telefonica, which is originally from, from Spain, is one of the largest telecommunications company in the world, to basically look at not the actual core telco business, but you know the, the digital layer that people were expecting that was going to happen on top of the telco networks. And that was you know, pre-iPhone. And actually, I was lucky enough that I joined the team with a you know, small group to start looking at you know, digital services beyond connectivity, like the year before the iPhone launch. And obviously the iPhone and then Android was like a game changer for the telco industry because people suddenly started using you know, applications on, on the phone, right? So the phones turn into mini computers and that completely revolutionized the industry. Unfortunately, telcos never managed to you know, capture any of that value. That value moved into a different layer and different part of the industry. And you know, after working in Telefonica for a few years, I moved to, to Dubai to work for another telco there. I was, you know, pretty bored of the industry and I thought like, you know, what is, what are interesting things happening? And fintech at that time was kind of starting as an industry and I thought it was very innovative and also that the banks were also more active there. And when I was looking at, you know, ideas on the fintech space, this is when I stumbled upon uh, blockchain. This was around 2016 when Ethereum had just launched and, you know, there were the, the frenziness of all the ICOs and, and this is when, you know, we thought, well, this is a a pretty cool way to raise money from individuals and to provide liquidity, which is something that doesn't exist in private capital markets. So why don't not doing it in a regulated way? And that led to the creation of Securitas. Wow. <laughs> that is an incredible story. I'm, I'm picking that up, right? You actually were in digital assets web two. Web uh, two, before, yeah. <laughs> before you got into digital assets web Correct. three. Um, it makes a lot it of actually sense. actually had a, a software that the, the industry term was digital asset management. Digitalized where right? you were the software was managing like basically pictures that were you know have copyrights and fonts and, yeah you know those are where the digital assets people use before. Right? Oh yeah, it still exists. Yeah, it, it, the it, company actually exists. It exists. reminds me of kind of funny when when the original topic of security tokens came out. There was the the physical bank security. Correct, tokens, the tokens. A lot of people, secure. Yeah, exactly. Confused. <laughs> By that. the way, we still use them when we connect to Coin Prime <laughs> and things like that. So that still exists as well. Lots of tokens out there. Lots of digital assets. But the only ones that matter we're talking about today are, of course, asset backed, securities backed. So what led to that light bulb moment? How did you get into digital assets from there? That sort of said, you know what? It's time to take the leap and said, this is the future. I think it was just to be uh, not to pretend I'm a genius that I saw the future. Uh, it was a bit accidentally. So, so the you know when ICOs were exploding, I started participating in ICOs to try to understand better how uh, you know blockchain was working. And it was very clear that you know there was uh, a, this was a very simple way to issue something that obviously I now in retrospect people understand that there were securities, but 
back then were not being treated as that, but issue something that represents something of, let's say, value or economic exposure in an underlying project, and at the same time, being able to trade it in a very efficient way, right? That's what a blockchain at the end of the day is, right? This is how you move value around in, in an efficient way. So at that time, then there was a lot of people, you know, I remember David Sachs being one of the very prominent ones. And, you know, there were companies that were just starting like, uh, you know, Polymath and, you know, Blockchain Capital did their ICO. And we like that looked like something very valuable. If you can actually do that with real, what people now refer to as real world assets, which are for the most part securities. And, and then try to digitize that process to make it more efficient. So, and that then I started learning about it. I had no idea. My background is not financial services. I was very naive thinking this is more of a technology problem when it turns out there's a huge regulatory component, which I'm pretty good at now, but not at that time. And, but they figure out like, look, you know, this, everything is solvable. So, you know, if there are regulations, we could probably call them and this platform looks like a more efficient way of doing it than traditional technology. So, so that's how we embark into the project without understanding how complex and how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the case for, for many, but I think you're being a little humble in the sense that, yes, you didn't have a finance background per se, but it required that technical background and marrying the, the concept of raising capital. You already saw, you had experience with you know, startups in the past of seeing, okay, mm -hmm. there's absolutely a, a use case here and, and definitely 2018 was a different animal <laughs> oh, yeah. than, it, than it is today you want to want to talk a little bit about how everything's shifted i think look so so there's there's a, a bit of a deja vu moment in the industry between 2018 and 2023 it's been five years in between so 2018 this is when you guys come fully launched and when we also launched and you know there were so many companies in the space it was harbor it was uh you know polymath talking of uh if any of them don't exist anymore mm -hmm. and um and there was like a, a lot of uh you know appetite for doing productive things with blockchain and there's also a lot of like pilots with banks and this company about digital assets that was going to digitize these changes and you know there was a lot of of that stuff happening in the industry and uh and unfortunately it, it didn't happen for for a variety of reasons i think first people companies like us or many others they probably didn't understand the complexity of this topic because it's not just a technology problem but it's a a regulatory problem and there was a lot of regulatory uncertainty is this legal can i actually use the token as the representation of the securities or not do i need to keep a copy of chain or you know if i trade it how do i settle a trade on chain like there's so many things that you know people didn't know how it worked um and there was no clear regulatory guidance today there is the second is that companies didn't have licenses to operate right so all the large regulated entities will not touch uh you know unregulated companies in this space because there is a lot of risk uh, to do that now it's a very different story like right? there's many companies now like us with a transfer agent with a broker dealer with an ats that can you know legally operate and approach any company in the space and give them comfort that this is legal and then on the other hand the other thing that happened is that the crypto industry itself just went off a completely different path which is the you know in my opinion the easy path of let's try to bypass regulations and play regulatory arbitrage issue things that don't look like securities even though they kind of like securities but you know pretend they're not you know people started continue doing icos in spite of the sec guidance that they were illegal and then when that ended up they come up with the concept of the governance tokens and then after that the nfts and you know you name it like there was all one thing after another and i think 2022 you know when everything came you know, crashing down and lots of companies went out of business. A lot of fraud uh, was exposed in the industry. Uh, the regulators started becoming more active in terms of enforcement actions, which I know people don't like in crypto. But, you know, in retrospective, if they had done more of it, maybe we wouldn't be here. And then now in 2023, I think a lot of crypto people have realized that you have to use blockchain to do productive stuff, right? You have to take assets that actually mean something and have a value and make them more productive and more effective by putting them on chain. And I think that's exactly the same vision that we had five years ago that now is kind of uh, manifesting. So, Well, let's talk about that vision and, and how you got there. Uh, you have acknowledged that you were not expecting, and I don't think anyone could have expected <laughs> the number of challenges and requirements that you go through, but you, you were many times the first, uh, first to get a transfer agent, the first to, to do many tokenization use cases. You, know, you were always on the ball well you know why was that it was just because you were you were getting great investors like i know you raised money from mufg and morgan stanley and many other blockchain capital you mentioned what what sort of you, you think made securitize that become sort of that go-to icon that really represents a lot of <laughs> today? Uh, that's a good question so i don't know i think that we've been 
you know, without sounding pretentious, I think we've been good at executing when we fix on doing something. We've also been good at not trying to do too many things and go one by one. And, you know, at the beginning, when everybody was trying to uh, become exchanges and broker dealers, we started with a very, very basic, uh, you know, concept of transfer agent. That was something that people in the industry were not aware of, uh, that was going to play a big role here. And then we've always been very conscious about spending money and not overbuilding and overhiring because that's what led to to the disappearance of many companies in this space i think as an entrepreneur there's certain things i can control who do i partner with who do i hire but there's one thing that is very hard to control which is the timing of what you do right and timing has always been the biggest uncertainty in our industry so i think the goal was you know first believe that it's going to happen have investors that have shared the same belief and second you know be able to to stay as long as it takes until yeah. that thing happened right and in terms of getting good investors i think this is a a consequence of that right like when they saw that we were executing we have obviously been in, in other industries and in other parts of our career myself and, and jamie and other team members uh with you know some degree of reputation and credibility and that Absolutely. that led to to have this very solid investor base that really believes in what we do and that they also understand that we're very conscious about how we are spending their money because it's their money at the end of the day and and always you know making progress yeah. in the industry so well before we move on from the ecosystem just so that everybody really truly understands that many people got into the space just in the last 18 months or so alone if you're picking up on this that's right securitize started out as technology they brought on a transfer agent license they went through and you know became a broker uh dealer through uh finra and many other uh and now you bought an ria recently as well so to expand the ecosystem to tap into registered investment advisors is there anything missing in the ecosystem now? <laughs> do you feel complete what you know what's your status no look i mean there is a bunch of stuff that uh at the end of the day if you think about like the, the other day the, the ceo of fidelity she said something that really resonated very well with me because it's actually the name of our company. She said tokenization is securitization on asteroids. And that's what it is, right? That's why we call securitized because even though I don't have a security, a financial services background, when I started looking at the process, it was like, well, if you're going to put assets on chain, you have to put them in a legal, within some sort of legal framework. Right? And that's what's called securitization yeah. in traditional capital markets, which is an extremely inefficient, cumbersome, and costly process. So if you can actually make that very efficient, then those assets, then also add other features like liquidity, lending, et cetera, then that you're transforming an industry. And that was always the vision, right? So to do that, there's a ton of things you need. You, you need somebody that can issue the securities and manage them and invest some boarding. That's the, the role of a transfer agent. You also need a fan admin. We partner with a lot of fan admins because those are, for the most part, these are funds or SPBs that have NAF calculations and accounting right. and stuff like that. You also need tax reporting. People don't realize these are these tokens are regulated, and then people like us, we have to produce 1099s and all that all that stuff. Then you need a places where people can purchase them. So these are like broker dealers, and then you need places where you can trade them. There are ATSs, and the part that has just is starting now, but this is still very emerging is how do I actually use those assets as collateral right. for lending, right? So you can then provide liquidity in a different way, right? Like you can provide liquidity by selling it, you can provide liquidity by doing redemptions or you can provide liquidity by borrowing against it. So there's still missing pieces yeah. in the ecosystem. So, <laughs> and then the recent acquisition we did with OnRamp uh, is something we started working with them. They're not an IRA, they're just an IRA enabling platform. So if you're a registered investor advisor and you want to purchase an asset, you know, you can purchase from Securitize, but it has to show up in your, you know, right. reporting system. So, so your investor sees that those assets are being managed by you. So you can also get commission. And there's a whole, you know, cumbersome process of how you, enable an IRA to purchase an asset on behalf of an investor, which in this industry, both digital assets and digital asset securities was missing that on ramp basically cracked the code. Um, so we started partnering with them. We really liked the team. Uh, I think Eric and Aston and Joe, they're fantastic and then decided to acquire them. Uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it sounds like you you went from first creating the technology, validating it in as many you know, possible use cases as you can. And now, traditional finance is starting to see the opportunity and you're yeah. offering the opportunity to partner in and really, you know, stick to the, you know, make as little disruption to adopting this as possible mm -hmm. by plugging into the infrastructure, like a, a technology tool, like on ramp, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, what is the most important you think for the industry in the next, you know, year or so? Is it, building a large user base of, of investors so that offerings can, can see demand? Is it the opposite? Is it continuing to find it incredible clients that maybe you should highlight like you've had, like KKR and Hamilton Lane and others? 
to really you know, continue to prove the institutional use case? What, what would you say is your priority at the moment that they, you think is going to have the most short-term effect when it comes to really, again, moving the industry forward? So this business is a two-sided marketplace, right? So you need assets and you need investors. I think the, the asset side, I wouldn't say solved, but it's already there. Right. And, you know, as you mentioned, we've partnered with, with KKR, with Hamilton Lane, with many other small ones in the past, but those are like very marquee names. And I think we don't have a shortage of tier one large asset managers that want to work with us, but they want to see that the other side is there as well. Right? And I think that part, investor adoption and, and more utility for, you know, tokenized assets as opposed to non-tokenized assets in, in a form of, you know, better liquidity, better redemption, better lending, et cetera. That's the part that, uh, in my opinion, is less developed. And that's where we should put the, the focus there, all of us collectively as an industry. And this is why we're quite on ramp because it's all about distribution and bringing more investors, et cetera. So I think that part to me is the part that if you look at the two sides of the equation, that is less developed today. And then in terms of what else needs to happen in the industry, I can tell you that my main concern now is that with this narrative of real world assets, which by the way is a terrible name, but at the same time, <laughs> it signifies that you know a lot of crypto people think what was happening before in crypto was not real, right? It was imaginary internet money, <laughs> things that are not That's real. So, that? so I, from that perspective, it's great <laughs> saying, okay, now we're gonna do real things instead of imaginary things on, on blockchain. That's great. But I see a lot of projects that are very non-compliant and uh, that scares me a lot because the last thing we need is more yes, fraud, more illegal activity happening, people misrepresenting what they do in terms of who they work with and saying, oh, I'm tokenizing BlackRock shares. No, you're not. You're just buying BlackRock shares from the open market and putting an SPV. That's not tokenizing BlackRock shares. <laughs> you have to work with BlackRock to do that. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of those things, a lot of crypto lending protocols for real assets that are, you know, questionable whether they're, uh, you know, legal or not. And I think that if, if that continue happening, it's going to scare both the, the real investors as well as the asset managers. So, so I think we as an industry, I think that if you look at crypto and, uh, you know, the, the crypto industry themselves should have attempted to self-regulate a little bit better to avoid all the, you know, uh, illegal stuff that happened. And I think in our industry as well, we should have that uh, as well and try to talk to each other and say, look, what are you doing? Maybe it's not very compliant. Maybe you want to think about not doing it. <laughs> or at least don't. Because it's, uh, you know, if it blows up, uh, it's going to impact, uh, you know, the industry. I don't know if you saw recently that they there was one of these stable coins that is supposed to be backed by real world assets that they were just like buying some really bad uh, stuff and then just they peg 50% and there's a credit protocol that was just basically buying very, very bad loans. And, you know, there's no point in putting those things on chain. Those are bad assets to start with. <laughs> so, and uh, and the, the, those things can actually bring a, a negative perception to, to this part of the industry, which at the moment is in a good place, right? Because at least people see them as regulated versus yes. the unregulated, et cetera. So. In, in another way of saying it, let's not hope the crypto RWA movement hijacks the overall correct you know, because, you know, transformation yeah. of finance, which is correct, what we're talking because, about. Because, you know, the okay, transformation of finance, we, we had this uh, recently in, in a different context, a discussion about CFI versus DeFi. And, and, you know, for a while, I love of DeFi as a technology. I think that DeFi is not something as of to, uh, the way it is designed today that no regulated entity is going to use. I mean, it's completely permissionless, completely anonymous. You don't know who your counterparty risk is. There's hacks all over, all over the place in the protocols and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that uh, scares. The, so I think that the CeFi approach with obviously blockchain underneath and it's, uh, you know, companies like Anchorage or, or us, et cetera, they're going to be the ones that should be leading the pack and we should just prevent that uh, all those things that are not compliant uh, spill into the into the space um, and then try to leverage the technology i think you know if i has built great technology maybe there's ways right. to apply it in a compliant way yeah. for real world assets and, and so there, productive stuff. there could be a world where you know you take advantage of the the licensure the infrastructure the network that you've created to take advantage of technology like an automated market maker but not necessarily you know you know eliminating the concerns of permissionless anybody can access Correct. it what's backing it you know these are key things that as investors and participants we need to know it's funny that everyone enjoys the freedoms if you will of crypto but then suddenly when you lose your keys or when you get scammed or whatever and there's no recourse Everybody is uh, suddenly changing their tune, right? Why yeah. is this you know, yeah. something that, well, you were lacking before? <laughs> <laughs> I think from the from the DeFi side, there's two things. Obviously, lending, which I think is super interesting, and it's easier to get it done in a compliant way. 
automated market making. You know, I love it. I love that that could be something because obviously, as an ATS, we suffer the problem of, you know, uh, listing uh, long tail assets that are illiquid, and that potentially has an opportunity to solve the liquidity problem for long tail assets the way they're solving it for digital assets. But the way it's constructed today, I think it's going to be very, very complicated to make it compliant. Yeah, because there's too many things that happen there that it's go against a ton of different regulations. So require a major regulatory change for an ATS like us to be able to use a uh, Uniswap title protocol right. as market making. But lending is is very promising. But lending seems like we we may soon see some features around <laughs> an obscuritized platform, which I I absolutely agree with. It's this concept of leverage that will bring in more interest. It is a form of liquidity many people yeah. don't don't think about, uh, and many people actually sometimes prefer. Especially like you said, these are long tail assets. Not everybody wants to sell early, uh, so Correct. there are other opportunities. Uh, I think that's great. Let's dive into a little liquidity a little bit more. We've talked about you know how you're building a, an audience. You've got potentially some of these technologies that are a little too early. What about market makers? What, what are some of the other solutions that you guys are, are developing in order to you know, create a robust market? This is very interesting because um, the, the way we built our trading uh, facility was to try to leverage as much as possible blockchain and to leverage the, something called the three-step settlement process that the SEC approved, where you basically have an order book, where you have a you know, an, you know, buy and sell and when there's a match. As an ATS, they will instruct uh, the custodian of the cash and the custodian of the securities to swap and then settle instantly, right? That doesn't happen in, in real markets. When you go to Robinhood and you purchase Apple shares, you're not really owning them until like two days after, even though Robinhood and all this, mark, they, they do a very good job on the UI to pretend that you own yeah. that. But, you know, you saw what happened with GameStop and other companies where there is this mismatch between the settlement periods uh, and, and there's a huge, you know, variation in, in, in price, right? So... So we settle in some. Now, what happens is that that goes against what a market maker does, because a market maker, what they do is they intercept orders. <laughs> so if, you, if you settle instantly, there's a hard power. Uh, so we, we're we like uh, trying to figure out how to combine the best of blockchain with market making, because obviously there's market makers that work for, you know, like all these markets, et cetera. So that's yeah. there. But, but I, I think that, you know, if I think of in terms of priorities, uh, you know, you have uh, our transfer agent and token system business, that's what's working today, good assets there. Then you have to get the, the investor distribution as much more investors participate in much more assets in the hands of investors. And then the third will be the liquidity mechanisms, which whether they're, you know, trading, which is one of them, uh, whether it's, you know, redemptions in a more efficient way, which is another very interesting thing you can do on chain. Absolutely. And the third one uh, is lending. So we kind of see the, the world in like these three yeah. uh, horizons. So. 2024 and beyond we, we you know it, it's safe to say the technology is obviously there you, you've done a terrific job how, how many you know uh, investors are on the platform now i think uh, it's so we have uh accounts these are not like yeah, yeah. investors that have sure, actually sure. invested anything around 500 25,000 uh so yeah. that's a lot we've talked with kyc probably like 150,000 of those and then the ones that hold securities are around 50,000 and, and I imagine that's it without counting our traditional transfer agent business, right, which is not digitized so I don't count it there but but it has made you technically a top 10 uh, largest transfer agent correct when we add the both things in terms of investors that we manage we're we're pretty large uh so but, uh, yeah. we, we hope there's an inevitable migration. Well, that's uh, the plan, uh, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so no, I, and that's what I think we're getting at, folks, is we're in that stage of, you know, companies like Securitize are doing an incredible job of, of providing the technology and enabling issuers to distribute and, and bring that audience in one place. And then the third factor will be that liquidity. Uh, there's a lot of people who look at this technology and they jump to that last part. But these last five, six years that have been happening have been because first we needed to make sure the technology is compliant and it works and institutions can rely on it just as much as a, a small entrepreneur. And now we have the proof in the pudding. People are raising capital. People are, are you know taking advantage of atomic swaps so that they can buy into and do instant settlement. That's something we actually took advantage of for our very yeah, own crowdfunding. You guys were very pioneers. With, uh, with you guys on that. So, you know, there's all these different uh, new eases, uh, ease of access to investing that tokenization is bringing that once people actually hold the assets, they're naturally going to start to eventually seek out uh, of course, potentially leverage, potentially, you know, some other kind of liquidity solution uh, that might be, you know, something that you guys are, are obviously working on with in partnerships. Is there 
any companies or anyone you'd like to highlight as well within your ecosystem that you feel are, you know, a, a critical part to this? So as I mentioned, we partner with a lot of uh, fan admins. So we partner with Formidium, we partner with Stonegate. So I think that's a, an integral part of what we do for for the, the tokenized funds that that we have. So so that's uh, that's great, and that's another industry that uh, you know probably requires digitization. Of course, the the asset managers for us they're not just partners; they are customers, but they they're great. So KKR was a very pioneer in that respect because it's a very well reputed. Uh, you know, brand that was the first one that did it, but um, and now we have in Lane, we have a, a very, very close partnership. We've launched already three different funds in three different verticals because at the beginning, what we want to do is to have a variety of assets to see what resonates better with investors. So, so we did a, an equity opportunities fund, a create fund that is in very well, and now we just recently launched uh, secondaries, which is a very interesting space because if you think about you know, the, the craziness with private equity and VC the last few years, there's a lot of people not have LP positions that they want to sell. So people buying on secondaries at a discount are going to probably have better returns. That's so a great use case. So that's a, a very good uh, uh, use case. So, and then we have others in, in the pipeline coming that hopefully we'll be able to announce soon. <laughs> not, nothing he can tease us with yet, but obviously <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure we get the word out once you do. I have no doubt there's some incredible partnerships behind the scenes that are that are happening just based on your track record alone. But you can't announce anything. Is there any advice or any you know predictions you'd like to leave our audience with now that we got the last couple of minutes uh, for anyone that's going into tokenization, either as an investor or a potential issuer? I think we've seen so far the size of the tokenized assets have been relatively small. You know, 10, 20, 50, 100 million. I think now Frank Templeton has one that has 150, but few investors. So, but I think that next year we're going to see the first billion dollar tokenized fund. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure about it. <laughs> um, so, and I think that's going to kind of like signal everybody out there that this is a real thing. Um, because once there's a billion dollar tokenized fund with interesting features that, that the traditional fund doesn't have, and then that's when people are going to realize, well, tokenized funds are actually better than non-tokenized funds because digitization helps you provide productivity and more features and, and other characteristics to the to the underlying fund so to me that's and that is when i think is going to be the, the inflection point um in the industry so so i'm pretty uh you know you know coming back here at some point yeah. in the next few months I, and tell I, you about it <laughs> i think that'll be the plan i mean you know the bigger these assets get of course that means the more potential interest and demand and shareholder potential correct and all these other features into, like exactly. liquidity lending exactly. like when the asset is small naturally it's, it's constrained right yeah. so look if you have a 10 million dollar asset that has 20 investors it's never going to be very liquid. It doesn't matter how good the technology to provide liquidity is. This, yeah. this, uh, and concerned. to say, it's still better than having no liquidity. That's or true. That's right? true. People don't hard. realize about it that, yeah. that, you know, some degree of liquidity is always better than zero liquidity. And liquidity is not black and white, by the way, it's a continuum, exactly. right? So, yeah. uh, but I think the bigger the assets are, the more, you know, obviously investors will attract to the space. And then the more cross pollination will be with other smaller assets. So, well, Carlos, uh, it's truly uh, a pleasure for me to be able to say that I've known you since the beginning. Yes, <laughs> and, yeah, we met uh, very, very early. Very early. <laughs> yeah, that's, we that's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, here we are today, and I, I'd still like to think we're just getting started. Uh, I think so. Uh, Look, I mean, the, the, you've probably seen this, this narrative saying every new innovation gets adopted faster. This is not music streaming, man. We're we're digitizing finance, right? So, right. so it's gonna take a bit longer and it's gonna be more complicated because you know the consequences of getting it wrong are pretty uh, you know uh, I don't know about you, but I'd like, like to keep my money and make sure exactly. no one goes so this to is jail. the thing well, yeah. I understand and that's why crypto is having so much tension with regulators because you know if something goes wrong there in let's say in the music streaming industry, you lose the song, right? But here you lose your savings. And there's so many people that lost billions of dollars through all the you know, debacles that happened uh, last year. So, and and I think that's going to make it go slower than, uh, you know, we expect, but it's is unavoidable, right? Yeah. Because all industries get digitized. So, so there's no reason why this industry is not going to get digitized. So. And it's great because it's in so many different use cases, the alternatives, private markets, the real estate, the credit, even the public markets, uh, they're all taking advantage of it in a different way. Um, and it's going to change the way banks today, folks, they, they still have errors. We saw also on Wall Street with GameStop, 
This will go away thanks to tokenization. Securitize, one of the leading companies making that happen. Keep up the amazing work, Carlos. Thank you for joining well, us. Thanks. And thanks again for the fifth anniversary. Appreciate it. <laughs>